Venom Computers. This is Intelligent Performance. Judith Virag, welcome to the Intelligent Performance Podcast. An absolute pleasure to have you with us. Um, for those who don't know, Judith is an award-winning business owner um, in the beautiful part of Calgary, in beautiful Canada. And it's a pleasure to have you on, Judith. Uh, you've just recently released a book, or uh, co-authored a book, called Culture Revolution, and it's all about different insights into how companies can actually create culture, innovate culture, and create an amazing culture. So it's a pleasure to have you on and to talk about a really, really important topic, and one which is actually really hard to get right. And so where I'd love to start with yourself, Judith, is what's your take on intelligent performance, just before we kind of dive into your area of expertise? Hi, hi, and thank you so much for having me on. Um, intelligent performance for me is somebody who educates themselves. Me as a business owner, I need to always work on myself to be my very, very best, especially in the field that I am in, because I firmly believe what sets me apart from the uh, competition is that I try to develop a strong leadership team. And there has to be a lot of intelligent uh, performance involved in that. And a lot of, you know, maneuvering, a lot of books, a lot of podcasts, anything that we can get our hands on to help our team grow. Oh, I love that. So it sounds like a real kind of commitment to ongoing development. And, and even though you've clearly got some 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 impressive skills, it's it's you don't you don't stop at that, which is super cool. So you your take on culture is really interesting. And I think it kind of weaves back to your heritage and your your kind of broader story, right? So just for those who are less familiar with your background, Judith, just catch us up a little bit on you know how did you get here to the and you know, and why do you think you've got something to say around culture in particular? So I was born and raised in Hungary and uh, we immigrated to Canada in 1989 and we spent before that three years stint in a refugee camp. Mm -hmm. So um, I think the way I got here is is quite strong. I was raised in the communist system. And when I say that, people are uh, right away, they're like, ooh, you know, it's like a bad word. But mm. it's not because for kids, it was really, really good. It was organized. We were always together. We always had something to do. Um, so it really taught me teamwork. Um, it's quite different when I came to high school here in Canada, actually, how in high school in Canada, they were focusing on the individual, which is none of them is bad but once they hit the workforce then they don't really know what teamwork is mm. so um so for me that was a really key element to learn and 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 as you can see i'm already talking with my hands and hence the the name of the company because i want to cultivate this closed good environment um where we're together uh we work for one cause and and kind of every everybody believes in in that cause really cool so let's just talk about communist life right because certainly there are there'll be misconceptions you hear a lot of rumors it's um if you read the american press or western press they they typically like to crap all, all over um all things communist and so from your perspective as a kid, and what how did you actually find it? It was great. I mean, education was free. And not only that, but at the time, Hungary was one of the leaders in education. Um, and uh, because the system it performs at a very high level, like even now, when you see athletes from Russia or from the Ukraine mm -hmm. competing, they 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 always strive for perfection. So um, and we don't like that word here in, in North America, you know, like what is perfection, right? Nobody's perfect. That's what we say. But they still strive for that. And so I'm kind of in between. I always want to strive for something that's always better, but yeah. not for perfection. And um, like just the small tidbits, like, uh, for example, meals were organized. We always had a warm meal at lunch or we had snacks. And, you know, every month I would take my money and it was very inexpensive uh, to pay in because the the uh, state had subsidized so much for the kids. And in the summertime, we had wonderful camps. And uh, also the communist system was very good at um, uh, developing leaders and recognizing leaders early because as early as 15, I was already sent to leadership camps. 
Wow. So I think that, you know, I know. So they were already setting me up on a path of, you know, developing somebody who's going to be leading teams and and teaching people. And it was it was just fantastic. I really, really loved those uh, those camps, actually. Wow. Was it actually a leadership camp or was it more of an indoctrination camp? Because that's typically what I, I guess it is. <laughs> As a kid, I just like to say leadership. And then if you, would talk to my, if you would talk to my mom and dad, they would probably say something different. And then my grandfather, again, would say something different because we're bringing in the generations here, right? So yeah. so let's talk about that in terms of the move. So it sounds to some degree a fairly blissful childhood, you know, that with opportunity, organization, learning teamwork or maybe discovering what the, the benefits of living and working as a team by the sounds of things. So for you, or maybe maybe more accurately for your family, why did they choose to take that really hard step of putting in, you know, of leaving and and knowing that probably they, they would end up in some sort of, uh, you know, migration camp before you can, can, can you know, actually you know, relocate? That's a really good question. My parents wanted more for me wow. because um, there were there were not many opportunities back then. And uh, I mentioned my parents were entrepreneurs. So entrepreneurship looked like my mom and dad owned the produce store and then they owned the cafe. So they were always hardworking, but somehow the money didn't follow and I'm not going to say wealth because we're not like we're not the type of people that we just want to get super rich we just you know I I always say I have my car I have my house I'm super happy once a year I can go on a vacation and that's all I need right I don't need more than that and my mom and dad are like that too but we were not able to have our own house for example and my mom and dad really dreamed about that they really wanted that so guess what we came here eight months later we bought our first house <laughs> you know like it, it like see the opportunities are just they were so different and i even to this day i say because uh, i travel a lot and i go back and you know i could live in hungary again no problem or italy or whatever because things are really really different now mm. but canada is still the land of opportunity there's there's so much opportunity or North America per se. Um, I find a lot more opportunities and people are so much more open to to each other and uh, and uplifting each other, helping each other. Mm, interesting. Tell us about the refugee camp experience, Julius. Like it, it strikes you see images uh, on the TV and it looks depressing, striking, really you know tough and living in a tent that kind of format what was that like for you what do you recall at that time so we left in 1987 april and there was something and I, please don't quote me but there was something in poland at the time too so a lot of polish people left as well so uh the refugee camp was an old military base in uh, in italy in latina lazio which is just below rome about 80 kilometers from rome uh, in between Rome and Naples. And when we got there, it was awful. It was awful. Like, I'm not going to lie. Um, mom and dad actually thought about turning back. Mm. And I was kind of the voice of the reason because I said, well, oh. we come this far. And if we go back, there's going to be repercussions. So because uh, their main concern was that I wasn't able to go to school. Right. So they didn't allow me to go to school because the process was that you would stay there for a year. But because the Berlin Wall came down in 1988 and plus we had different plans, like we wanted to go to Australia and we waited six months for them to tell us you can go there because you have no sponsor and da da da. So we got stuck in there for two years, eight months. And I was out of school. That was my high school years. So um, that was a tough part for mom and dad. I am very resilient. I was like, I'm going to go to work. And so I did anywhere from babysitting, house cleaning, uh, harvesting, you know, whatever. I didn't I was I was the house laundry because we didn't have a, a, a washer. So we I washed everything by hand. So yeah. that was my job. And yeah, so I mean, I we made it work. Um, there were some very difficult moments. And I think the difficult moments were more like um, when you're taken advantage. 
And, and, and also because I was a young girl, I was between 15 and 18. There were some very, very sketchy situations, but my dad is a big guy. <laughs> so he was all, like, we were always together. And one thing that really made us as a family is this experience because mm. some families fall apart and we were like always together. So mm. I really, really, really grew super close to my mom and dad and we're close to this day. I am so grateful. Wow. Incredible. I'm curious. It sounds like you'd be isolated off in, you know, detached from other people by being in this refugee camp. But are you saying that you were able to leave to work to babysit? That kind of yeah. Thing, or were you? Yeah, right. Interesting. And so yeah, the, and the Italian system is very interesting, was very interesting. And you could work under the table for cash. Oh. And they took advantage in that area. They really took advantage of that. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Okay. So they're exploiting the, the free labor, which isn't not allowed, but the, the refugees would love it because they're bored senseless, largely, and stuck in no education, just kind of like a holding pattern for two years, eight, eight months. That, so, And your parents, how do they navigate it? Uh, pretty good. Great sense of humor. That's yeah. for sure. <laughs> and, uh, and I mean, my dad, my dad was uh, and still is the life of the party all the time. So he's uh, he's very social um, and we are very social as a family. So there was never an issue about that. We made fan friends really quickly. Uh, we integrated very quickly. Um, so my dad actually really loved Italy. I, I think if we could have stayed there, we might have. Yeah, because he, he loved it. Yeah. And I'm not going to lie. Like, I mean, come on, Italy. It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> this was like, this was like 38 years ago. And 38 years ago, Italy was hopping. But I just went back. I was actually just in Sicily. Right. And it's interesting to see how much they have changed. I mean, they got tons of tourists and everything. Yeah. But some of the families that we kept in touch with, like everything just kind of stayed the same for them. Mm. They didn't evolve, evolve, right? So it's it's an interesting um, social experiment per se for me. For sure. So tough times, contrary to popular belief, often produce great results, right? And, and in the Western world, it seems that we have a weird complex around challenge or um, in pain almost, we tend to do the opposite where we now go for ultimate comfort, you know, comfort food and be comfortable. You've got these huge thick mattresses and thick shoes and it's all really about avoiding pain and often to the detriment actually. You know, the more comfortable you are, the more you have a great comfy couch which you sit on and watch TV and quote unquote you're comfortable, arguably that produces issues down the track. So I'm really curious then how, what impression or what mark did this leave this kind of upbringing experiences seeing how you know extreme poverty being trapped in a like could be a really unfair system you know like that like the whole refugee migration process i know i've gone through it not not to your extent but just moving countries and and all of a sudden you realize crikey this whole thing called borders you know like it's it's a real thing like people get really antsy about passports and where you were born and so what mark have you found that's left in terms of judith as a business owner now? um so just to a comment to comfort i always say that success is at the end of your comfort level mm. so um because there there's so many things that were outside of our comfort level so how how does that make me a business like how do i bring that into my business every day every day just being my authentic self mm. i think that's that's the most important thing and i'm not i used to be i used to feel like you know i don't belong and you know the high school experience is every everything like in the movies right so imagine me you know not speaking any english being thrown into high school i was almost 18 years old i had to start uh, grade 10 
um, and just kind of thriving even that situation because I actually adored my teachers. Mm. Um, they were really, they were so different than in Hungary. In Hungary, where they were very rigid, very strict. And here they were kind of like fun. And, you know, they would put in cool music uh, <laughs> and then they would do math. And my English, I had the same English teacher for three years and I adored her. Mm. Um, and my ESL teacher was fantastic. So, so it just... It's just, I think it's uh, as a business owner, you always have to be you. And sometimes we all struggle with that. How much can we show to our team? How how vulnerable can we be? And it's all a learning curve. But I always notice the more vulnerable I am, the better result I get from my team because they can relate better. So if I talk about my experience, like, for example, I'm, I hire Ukrainians right now. They are immigrating to Canada because we know what's happening. Mm. And, um, and I see myself in them when I landed and we didn't speak any English. And I like, you're just like a, like a deer with the headlights in your eyes. Mm. Like, like, oh my God, like, and, and Canadians are so nice, so welcoming. And we had this lady from the church who helped us. And, and so this is what, what I want to give back. This is my why now. I think your why kind of changes as you age, but this is very important to me now is to uh, give chance to somebody who comes here, doesn't speak any English. There's not much more th that they can do than cleaning. And we're just going to work with them and get them trained and we'll work through the language barrier, you know, um, and, uh, and kind of that's how I bring it in. It's just like being as I mentioned now twice, just being myself. <laughs> mm. Well, I think yeah. being yourself sounds actually like someone who's got great compassion, actually. And maybe your experiences sound like they've significantly shaped how you how you see the world and such that when you see these Ukrainians coming through, um, and I came, we went to the UK recently and we met this lady in the play park with her young son and she had been put up by a family in the UK. She'd left her husband who was fighting the war back home. And I was like, wow. And she was there alone. And I was just like, geez, this is, like, it, it really struck home at that point. You know, what, what this actually means. What does war mean in Ukraine? What is, you know, and then what is it, what is relocate? You know, like you've got, you've left your family, your husband's not there. You know, solo parenting, I can't stand solo parenting for like a weekend, like it's hard enough, let alone um, for a, for you know, for an extended period of time when you don't speak the language in a foreign country. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a world of challenge that. So uh, that's really incredible, Jude. So tell me about Clean Club Calgary and, and also how this relates to your book in terms of the cultural revolution. What do you think people can learn from this? Um. So... When when I started my company, I had a big stint in uh, corporate. I was an executive assistant for 15 years and um, I just got really tired of the accountability piece. And I decided that, you know what, I'm just going to go clean. I cleaning is comfortable. I like the <laughs> physical work and, you know, I am accountable. So if I mess up, I'm not going to pass the buck. I'm just going to say, I'm sorry, I messed up. This is how I'm going to correct it. And let's just move on because <laughs> that's just how I am. Right. And yeah. And then um, within, because I had such a big network within about a year, I, I started, I was referred so much I can handle it on my own. And I had no aspirations of starting a company, but I'm like, okay, I'm going to hire. I hired family and friends. I made really big mistakes. So I had a business meltdown, I call it, in 2016. And you know how when you are in a bad relationship and uh, uh, you Google a divorce lawyer or a uh, therapist? So I Googled a therapist <laughs> instead of, uh, so a business coach. And I started working with Vince. Mm. And Vince was the one who kind of introduced me to culture. And I think everybody is knows culture. We know what it is. But once you start a business, sometimes you get 
I think confused, like what I can do and what I can say. You're not your true authentic self yet because mm -hmm. there's so many variables. So Vince uh, started like, okay, so let's develop your values. Let's de develop your mission. Let's develop your uh, vision. And uh, we started working on that and it was a big learning curve. And I invited my team to develop the uh, vision statement, mission statement and values, core values, mm -hmm. basically set a foundation for our culture. Mm -hmm. But a lot of it, I'll be honest, was me because you want to surround yourself with people. Yeah. like So hard work, definitely one of my core values, you know, fun is definitely another core value. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I wanted to have that around me. So the lesson perhaps it sounds like companies who don't build or aren't clearly communicating or aware of their values. Is that what you see is the kind of a, a really big missing for companies? Yeah, especially in my industry. So my industry mm. is uh, a lot like, you know, how I started, but my strength, Vince was telling me this, that I have this very strong admin background and mm. corporate background. So mm. I, I understand. So I think the biggest um, challenge is one thing is to define your values and your corporate culture. Another thing is to practice. <laughs> living, right? Yeah. So it's one thing to have it on the wall or have it on the, you know, whatever. It's another thing is like when you know, when somebody um, mm -hmm. calls in sick and when somebody does not show up for work, one of our core values is reliability. So we talk about that, you know, what does that look like? And, mm -hmm. you know, when you leave and what are the, um, what are the, uh, um, uh, I want to say it really quick. Uh, what are the, so what happens when you call in sick or you don't show up for work? What happens to your other coworker? They have mm -hmm. to pick up the slack. So we kind of walk them down on this. And then, you know, always like, you wouldn't want something like that happen to you, right? So um, you don't want to be picking up the slack all the time for somebody else. Yeah. So so that's how we we do it. Or another is like, you took on a weekend work because one of our client really wanted a weekend work. Thank you so much. You're so reliable and we really appreciate that. So I think it's just putting it into, into your everyday lives, like, and be higher and fire based on our core values. Got you. Really cool. So it sounds like super committed, but get really clear to find. And then there's the next part, right? Which is about um, stepping into and honoring practicing um operate with integrity around your your core values right and i think i have i'm not sure if you've come across the brand thank you but they're a purpose-based business they um, their intent is to change consumerism actually you know, that's their key goal to change how we can you know, how we consume things and and end global poverty and it's really incredible when you talk to daniel who's the ceo with his with his wife justine and they talk about being a purpose-led so they recently had one of their main product lines, that being bottled water, and they realized that actually they couldn't get it to align with their core values. They felt it was unaligned, so they stopped their core, one of their core and best sellers, which is pretty much how they started the business. And it's like, wow, and that that's some really tough choices. So for you, where have you found you've had to make some really tough calls to actually be aligned with the values that you say you value? Um, I think it's every day. I think people are very um, easily tell a white lie. I can do that. I am responsible for other people putting the food on the table. So I have to be as transparent as I can. Um, I, I I take that very much to heart, you know, and, and also I think because I'm leading a, a team now, so not my, my team members who are cleaning, but my team members who are my management team, right? So my supervisor, my office admin, my sales rep. So I have to teach them and coach them every day on, on these things. 
And to answer the question which you asked, when uh, when it's misaligned, I think you feel it in the gut. Mm. And uh, I I always stay. Lori, my supervisor, she's always you know she's responsible responsible for the field. So we always you know do we let this person go? Do we still work with this person? You know, there's a lot of discussions around that. Um, I always tell her go with your gut feeling. Because yeah. people are so often not listening to their gut. Yeah. And most of the time it's right. Yeah. Right. So there's a there's a lot of situations where you have to think, think with your brain. Uh, but I think having that gut feeling and acting on it is also very important. What's your take on people? Let's say you you hire someone and they, and they maybe they say that they value hard work as an example. And then maybe your hard work and definition of what hard work looks like appears to be or shows up as different for them ultimately, right? Um, how do you think about the ability for people to shift and change their values from that from that capacity? Is that something where you'd go, okay, cool, we can help nurture that, or are you more of the view that it's inherent, it's fixed? See you later. No, always nurture. You always have to nurture people because you never know who's going to walk through the door and you don't know what they are dealing with. Uh, so I I think nurturing is the, the best thing you can do. Of course, sometimes there's an end to nurture or or something has to end because the other person is not behaving in a way that, you know, that let's say they're grateful for it, or you don't see improvement. And that happens a lot of, a lot of times, you know, unfortunately nowadays uh, we get a lot of, uh, you know, issues like ADHD, HD and autism and everything. And sometimes it's, it's uh, you want to always work with those people, but even just regular people, if you see that there is like nothing clicking in there, or maybe they are not in it for the right reasons or whatever that is, you just have to have that conversation with them that maybe this isn't the right place for them. And sometimes that's the best thing you can do with them is to let them go. Um, I remember when I was still in corporate, um, my ex boss he used to say if you don't want to be here we'll help you leave and I remember because I was a very dedicated employee always and I remember thinking that's directed at me maybe and how, how can he say that of course I want to be there and I'm going to demonstrate to him I want to be there and and then but now owning my own business I totally understand what he meant mm. that these people are good people but they're just maybe not right for my boss that's mm. all you know? McKinsey, yeah, McKinsey and Co. have a really wonderful, it, it seems harsh when it comes to their review system. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but they're, I think they have like four levels. Like you're either above, like you're on the way or something like that. You're at standard or the last one is council to leave. <laughs> yeah, it's, if you got into McKinsey, you're probably in the top 1% of employee yes. candidates anyway. But, and I love that transparency, they all that kind of like rigidity, because they know, having been in business for like 60 years now, maybe longer, is they know what it takes to get to the top as a, in their discipline, in their domain, and to, to achieve what they're trying to achieve. And they're very clear about what that looks like earlier on as well. And it allows them to counsel to leave is a powerful thing because they see taking care of people leaving their organization or finding not a fit and helping them resettle in often some of their clients' businesses, because they're great candidates, they're just not necessarily right for McKinsey. And they actually find that as you have them leave, they become future customers because they do that offboarding so well. And I think it, to me, I'm just like, wow, it's such an intelligent way to think about your hiring. It sounds like for you too, what's the, how does that play out over time? Do you find staff members change, come back, refer? How does that yeah, we, yeah, they refer, they have come back for sure. Um, I think for me, the biggest one is when they refer. Uh, 
Mm. And, uh, you know, we have started to build up such a reputation. This was one of my BHAG actually, is I wanted um, employees to knock on our door uh, because, you know, we're one of the best in our field. And it does happen. We actually have people walking in at the door. <laughs> and I always say to my team, if somebody walks in at the door, I'm not there or Lori not there, have them wait just a little bit and I'll be right there. Because for me, it takes so much courage for Great. somebody to show up like that yeah. and then you know like i mean we do have some qualifying questions right in the beginning but if they qualify all like i'll show up right away and i'll interview them and if it if if i can i after i have checked the references i'll hire them yeah. one of the best employees i've ever hired she walked into the office and i, I only heard about her like a few days later and i was like Get her on the phone. Get her on the phone immediately. <laughs> I was like, yeah, an like incredible Colombian lady. And, you know, not English wasn't her first language. She's, you know, in Australia. And I was just like, wow, that takes real courage to walk into an office. You know, not, not, many, not many people do that. So just tell me a little bit more about your business, Judith. So in terms of, you know, what type of cleaning? Are you commercial, residential? What's that kind of nature of that? I like to say we do everything that doesn't scare me <laughs> with the limitations. Um, we do have a lot of referral partners because, you know, people always ask me this because it's shown on TV, you know, hoarders and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. We don't do that, but we have a really, really great referral partner who does biohazard cleaning and things like that. So we do mostly residential cleaning, reoccurring, you know, weekly, biweekly, monthly and commercial cleaning uh, offices. Small offices are our jam. Okay. And then we also do like deep cleaning, moving cleaning, post renovation cleaning. So anything Thing to do with the homes really what whatever stage that, that they are in got you and a notoriously tricky sector to retain staff because the barrier to entry into the cleaning space is pretty low often right we see in australia like you know it doesn't take too much to fire up your cleaning company buy a mop and some sponges and you're in business in some capacity right and the insurance is there's not much of a barrier to entry so how do you create a culture where you've got people who want to stay, even though they know that you're charging the client X and they get a percentage of X in the end? Um, support. I have Lori, my supervisor, and we work really hard. So if the team reaches out, they, their concern is number one for us. And so anything that they need help with, you know, they might need you know, for example, today somebody's uh, uh, power head broke. So Lori quickly had to rush a power head out to them. Uh, sometimes that creates a little bit of stress, of course, when equipment breaks on for the team members. Um, and, and just the big support, like with anything. And we like to know about their dreams. You know, um, I highly recommend for uh, people who uh who own businesses or they manage people to read the book uh, Dream Manager um, because it's it, like you want to work with your people and you want to kind of help them along with their dreams, whatever that might be. And I'm not one of those cleaning companies that if somebody comes to me and they say, you know, maybe three years, I might want to start my own business and I will not hire them because I am actually grateful if somebody stays with like two, three, four, five years, whatever that is, because nowadays it's really hard to find career cleaners mm. and clean is not a career. Mm. Like, I don't like to say that because it, it isn't. It's hard on your body. It's hard on your mind sometimes, too. Uh, and and also it's just it's just a stepping stone a lot of times for a mm. lot of people. It was a stepping stone for me as well. When I came to Canada, I didn't speak English. I cleaned offices, right? So talk to me about the dream manager. I'm just pulling up on my screen here. So what did you take from that book out of interest? What, what did it, what, what were some of the things which resonated that you're, with you? That you're engaged with your team as a, as a, supervisor owner yeah. whatever role you are and you know your team and you know their aspirations so let's say you know one of them wants to buy a house so how do i make that happen how do i make that happen i make yeah. that happen you know if they find a house and maybe they need part of down payment i'll give them to give it to them you know like three thousand dollars like if you think about it if you want to retrain an employee and hire a new employee um you know 
that's a lot more than three thousand mm-hmm. dollars and it's a way it's a way in a bonus and then you give it to them because of something that they really want or they might you know i had one of my team members um was bringing their mom out here because they had a brand new baby and his his mom uh, was coming from colombia so i said to him michael how much is the ticket he's like it's thousand dollars okay so i wired him thousand dollars and i said to him i really hope that your mom is a great help to you guys and she has an excellent stay here you know or my other this one was like probably the cheapest one uh wanted um to see her girlfriend and she's like she lives in Kelowna and and I said okay so how much is the ticket it was two hundred dollars I'm like you joking and she was happy as a skunk you know Mm -hmm. so I made like small you make small uh, dreams happen really cool very powerful though right and it communicates as you we link back to values and how that may can come across and that's it's the difference between as you would you define easy to define very different yeah. things, right and and you make them feel you i i don't even want to make them feel i want them to know that they are important to me mm. and that's probably it right i feel like there's often a dissonance or a detachment from managers feel like their employees are a pain in the butt often you know like they're the source of frustration <laughs> other than what you're tuned into is really actually it's very much a collaboration it's teamwork it's partnership you can't we can't it's hard doing life on your own is is hard work right and that 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 sounds like what's kind of really coming across from what you're saying judith would that be right yes i mean i talk a big game but sometimes we fail miserably (laughs) you know sometimes you know like like any other company i think sometimes you might have a very disgruntled employee who you might have hired because you needed a body in the job and you're not really concerned because those times like two years ago it was really really hard to find team members really hard like i I can't even tell you how much time, money and effort we spent on recruitment. And 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 like when somebody like literally had two hands, two legs, could see straight, we you're hired. <laughs> <laughs> you call <it> up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So 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 it's just like some some days are really really hard, um but overall, um I I think sometimes people don't even realize this as you're growing, the bigger yeah. your team is. Sometimes people say more people, more problems. I don't say that. I, I think it's just actually gets easier. Yeah. And the reason why it got easier for me, because I had a lot of support, yeah. like in my management team. Cool. Very cool. <laughs> Judith, you got a really interesting story. For someone who runs a cleaning company, you might, it, you know, not exactly the world's most interesting business often, you know, like it's very important. We all hire cleaners and, but in terms of, I love how you've kind of, you've brought that all together. And I think you've got a really unique perspective and your, your heritage, your background, your experience, those formative times in the refugee camp. Uh, yeah, it's amazing how humbling it is. In many ways, it sounds like that whole experience was for you and the difference that then allows you to that change in perspective. You know, early in my career, I had a similar, had a business which failed and it and it was such a, a humble right up after, you know, but I, and I, you know, stopped being such an arrogant, you know, everyone should be great and, you know, becoming quite angry when people weren't really pushing and I, it brought a lot of empathy. And, I, and that's, for me, that's what really stands out about you your approach and it certainly sounds like your approach to culture yeah thank you and i i agree with that i think it's always giving the benefit of the doubt to everybody until they prove you wrong and if they prove you wrong you just got a part that's what it is right so that's a beautiful way to leave this conversation judith thank you so much for taking the time out in your afternoon to speak with us it's been an absolute pleasure we're going to link to the book culture revolution i'm struggling to say that culture revolution um the links below you've got the american and the canadian uh, links there um of course if you're living or yeah listening to this elsewhere of course the the us amazon is probably the best place to go so judy thanks again uh, it's been a pleasure thank you so much